Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steve Zerker. We have a very special episode today based on uh, news just as of last week. Um, the ambassador to Japan has been uh, nominated by, Professor, uh, by President Biden. His name is Rahm Emanuel. Some of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with him. We're going to talk now about the pros and cons of this nomination, whether he'll actually be confirmed, and what the consequences will be for the Japan-U.S. relationship if he indeed does become ambassador uh, sometime later this year. So thank you very much for joining the show. We really appreciate it. I have a very special group of people, all related to my university, Kansai Gaidai in one form or other. Let me start with Paul Scott. Paul Scott's a professor of political science, a PhD from Virginia, professor emeritus from Kansai Gaidai University. He's on the upper left corner. And then we have Jiri Maseki, who's a Kansai Gaidai graduate, and JD MA from Washington University in St. Louis, wonderful school, great baseball team as well. He's joining us. He's a Chicago resident for a number of years. We have Johnson Portu in the lower left. <clears throat> Johnson is a PhD from Michigan, undergraduate Berkeley, also a professor at Kansai Gaidai University. And last but certainly not least, we have the, the acknowledged expert on diplomacy because uh, S.Y. Kim has a PhD in diplomacy from the Tufts School, Fletcher School of Diplomacy. Uh, he is also a professor at Kansai Gaidai University. So thank you very much, guys, for uh, participating in today's show and discussing this uh, interesting news. So let me start uh, with you, Paul, just a couple minute response. What did you think when you read this a few days ago? What was your immediate reaction to this nomination? Uh, surprise uh, yeah. on a number of levels that uh, I wondered why, uh, why, um, why President Biden would uh, would go back again to the Obama administration uh, and take someone uh, who has no experience in in, in diplomacy um, and was has also um, uh, very tainted at a variety of levels, um, both the um, the murder of uh, uh, of Laquan McDonald as well as um, I'm not accusing uh, Mr. Rama of financial irregularities. But um, he was uh, certainly involved uh, in um, in uh, making an awful lot of money in a very short period of time, uh, sixteen million dollars in two years, uh, to be exact, after he left the Obama administration. Um, wow! So that may come up at a um, this is a financial disclosure stage, um, statement that has to be made uh, for ambassadors as well. So that may come up. Interesting. I was surprised. Okay. Jerry, you're, you lived in Chicago. You're familiar with Chicago politics. Uh, you previously uh, had been involved in uh, the effort to uh, have Obama become president within the Democratic Party. So I'm sure you're familiar with Rahm and the, his history. What was your response when the news broke? Actually, I think I sent you the news and you responded to me. What did you think? Yes, I did. And uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, pleasure to be with you. So I was uh, also surprised uh, at the same time, uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, happier, or more excited uh, for, about the nomination. I, look, look I, I think that it's a bold choice. It's, it's definitely a bold choice. It isn't, isn't someone that someone would automatically think would be, you know, the ambassador to Japan. But Rahm Emanuel has, he's an extremely intelligent man, and he has, and while he, of course, like many politicians, has certain uh, issues, you know, in his past that, that you know, people might bring up as time goes on, he does have a reputation for getting things done. I mean, this, this, this is, a, this is a, a person who is very, very, and has been very, very involved uh, in politics for quite a long time, from the Clinton administration through the Obama administration. He is very close uh, to the uh, Democratic in, inner circle, and so I, you know, I I think it has the the possibility. We'll see. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, but we'll, it has the possibility to actually be be, be quite a good pick. We'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. So my reaction was uh, was uh, also surprised, but perhaps a bit more optimistic. Okay, interesting, Johnson. What what were your thoughts when you heard this? 
Actually, I first found out about it on a Twitter feed. And there's a lot of academics on Twitter that are probably not going to be invited to the embassy uh, from, from, from what I saw. But my initial reaction was kind of a, a potentially a missed opportunity. Uh, but I usually don't like first reactions. I like to think about things a little bit slowly. And so I started thinking about, well, what are they actually trying to trying to maximize? What is the kind of calculus uh, in, that, in that decision? And so there are a number of good points or positive points for why uh, he might be a good choice, but there is also some uh, reservations, uh, reservations that I have. Uh, and Dr. Scott had mentioned uh, a couple of those in terms of training, diplomacy, uh, and so on. So I'm still kind of unpacking my thoughts on this. Mm, but a missed opportunity in that there, there are probably many other candidates potentially that would be better? Well, if I, uh, if I, if I think about it, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think what are they trying to maximize? And if we think about what is a, a bad ambassador versus a good ambassador, what mm. are some variables? Well, things like intelligence, right? So IQ, he has that. Uh, things in terms of his closeness to, uh, to the White House, he has that. And, uh, things in terms of his negotiating skills, he has that. Uh, but when it comes to training, when it comes to his experience, that's really what gives me pause. That's a, that's a big question mark. Uh, yeah. And it seems like there are a lot of other people that had similar qualities uh, that Emmanuel has, but also uh, the experience. Part of it, though, also uh, is a function of who's going to be advising him and whether or not he's actually going to listen to these people uh, with experience. Uh, and then I don't have that information as to whether or not he can, he can do that. So... Initially, I think it's a it's a maybe a good choice with a big question mark, basically. Thank you. That's why I, I don't know as a part of your uh, your PhD or your studies currently. Do you look specifically at the selection of the ambassador as a part of uh, the, the the diplomacy relationship between the United States and Japan? I know you are focused on the Japan U.S. relationship and the teach courses on the history of that. But is this something that you pay particular close attention to? And then also, what was your reaction when you heard this? Well, in general, I pay attention to that. Uh, and uh, with the historical context, and uh, it's not unusual for U.S. president to appoint political appointee to Japan. More prominent U.S. ambassador to Japan has been political appointees even before the World War II and since then onwards. Mm. And uh, my uh, initial response was, as long as he can, the Emmanuel can restrain his uh, tendency to outburst and uh, confront, then he has a potential to make success. The reason being that he has great access to the president, Biden, whom he knows personally well, and his views will be listened to. And in my view that uh, President Biden had some agenda when appointing him, some reason, uh, because United States-Japan relation will be very crucially important, uh, as a, perhaps uh, quite as important as U.S.-China relations. Uh, U.S.-China relation will be more confrontational, obviously, but U.S.-Japan relation, Japan should do something to support very proactively United States. And then Japan has a uh, great reputation or notoriety of euphemism. Uh, on the one hand, superficially say yes, but do not deliver that. But Mr. Emmanuel has <laughs> great reputation as well as no try to get things done. But mm -hmm. how to do that? Uh, he should use euphemism and then learn the language of diplomatic communication, which should be clear, okay. but in a very moderate, with a great moderation, not uh, outburst or direct talk. That's my uh, first response. Okay. All right, thank you all for those uh, initial responses. I, let me just, for those of you that are listening, viewing and, and maybe are not familiar with Rahm Emanuel, although I suspect most of you are. Just very briefly, his background I put together, he uh, emerged into the political world as a congressman from Chicago. And during that time, as Jerry mentioned, he was a legislative aide to the Clinton administration. So that's where he began to climb the ladder into the inner circle, which all of you talk about that he is a part of, uh, <clears throat> to the point that Obama chose him as the chief of staff. And I, I remember when that decision was made, and that was quite controversial too, that uh, he was selected for that role. 
And uh, to Jerry's point, um, he, uh, according to Obama in his, uh, his uh, recent book, he was particularly effective in getting the agenda carried out that Obama had laid out for him. But basically, uh, Obama went through the list of everything he asked Emmanuel to do as chief of staff. Uh, he served for two years in that role. And uh, Obama said basically he, he accomplished everything. Of course, the major thing is the Obama health care plan, which Emmanuel was able to get through Congress. And that was no, no easy task whatsoever. And then after that, he became the mayor of Chicago. And uh, that, I think, is where the, the liberal establishment progressive folks have, are the most upset with him. He's 61 years old. Um, he is a triathlete. Um, so he's an active athlete. He's, if you see a picture of him, you notice that he's very thin, and that's why. That's why. Uh, I did a little bit of research on his nicknames. He has a variety of nicknames that he has picked up, some of which I cannot actually mention on air, uh, but one of them is the Rominator. So kind of, uh, you know, the, the emperor. There are a lot of themes about the emperor. And then one that's particular to Japan, and this was published before the nomination, obviously, is Top Ramen. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the Japanese press will pick up on that nickname uh, when he does become uh, uh, the ambassador, if indeed that does happen. So that's a very brief background uh, about him. So let's uh, we'll go ahead and open up the discussion here. You guys have touched on the two issues that uh, I picked up in the reviews of this nomination. There seems to be two factors. Uh, one is that he clearly is a power within the Democratic Party. Party. He's a very good buddy of David Axelrod, who was the guy who helped Obama become president. Uh, Axelrod helped, uh, I, I can't remember specifically, but uh, they're both Jewish. And when Rom got married, it was in the Jewish faith. And uh, Axelrod served as a, a, a strategic uh, position or uh, to uh, make sure that the marriage occurred. He, he was, it was an honorable position. So there's that kind of tight connection between the two of them. But on the other hand, um, he has a reputation for speaking without thinking. Even in Obama's book, uh, after uh, the elections, the midterm elections, where the Democrats got wiped out, Emmanuel was going out around in Washington, D.C., and saying, I told the president not to do this. I told the president not to do this. So he was actually criticizing Obama after Obama was uh, defeated or the Democratic Party was defeated uh, in the midterm election. So let me just throw it out to you guys. Uh, these two factors, uh, it sounds like you basically agree with them. Some of you already commented about that. Um, and uh, how do you think that it, he would be able to manage these two things or, or how would Japan respond to this? Uh, the fact that he's an insider, but yet he's clearly not what we would consider to be a diplomat. So I'll just throw it out to all of you. Just speak up, uh, whomever would like to comment on that. Yeah, Steve, I'll, I'll uh, maybe just start off if it's okay. Um, yes, please do. You know, the, the common denominator, you, you mentioned three people uh, just now, uh, Obama, Axelrod, and Emmanuel. The common denominator of all those is the state of Illinois and Chicago, the city of Chicago. Now, for, for those who are familiar with U.S. politics or local politics, Chicago is has a very, very unique uh, political culture uh, that that goes back uh, a number of decades. Uh, there was a famous mayor, Daley, two of them actually. Rahm actually was also in, involved in in the latter uh, Daley administration. So he, it, it, there's a very big Illinois connection. Now, as far as is, is him not being a diplomat, I think it was it was mentioned by Professor Kim earlier. The United States, I mean, normally it's political appointees, right? Who who are who are uh, yes, yes. So the most recent to Japan. They, these are high profile people yep. that that put Japan uh, on the map uh, in 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 the in the public consciousness through the uh, notoriety of the ambassador. These are not professional diplomats normally right uh so i think that i think this was as was also said earlier because uh rahm emanuel has very close ties to the democratic party and the president that's what's going to be valuable mostly uh for for the u.s japan relationship so i'll, I'll leave it there and let someone else uh give their yeah, opinion as well. if, you, if i may i think that's i think you're completely correct uh his relationship uh with uh the democratic party uh, but, you know, traditionally, 
maybe uh, you're completely right again that uh, um, uh, that you know who is who is appointed political appointees and also fundraisers. Um, and what uh, happens with uh, with uh, Ram is that he's both. Uh, he raised a tremendous amount of money uh, for Obama. Uh, again, from Chicago sources, uh, many of them. I heard, uh, and also a tremendous amount of money for Mr. Clinton. I, I got a figure of seventy-two million dollars. Wow! Um, no, you know, I, I did my, I did uh, looked at this, and wow. uh, for Obama and for Biden. So these things overlap, but um, uh, you know what? Where you know. Negotiating a trade agreement, and there has to be a trade agreement that that, that will be or should be uh, negotiating during the Biden administration. Um, that's different than negotiating uh, security, uh, freedom of navigation in the seas, China, uh, North Korea um, at that level. Um, so that's a different skill set, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the trade function, sure. Uh, but um, uh, the peace and security section, that is uh, extremely delicate and very, very sensitive. I agree. If I yeah. agree with uh, Professor Scott completely. And then when it comes to security issues, uh, the new uh, Mr. Emmanuel should take into account that there is something what he could do as ambassador and what he could not, because it's basically interstate relations or very sensitive issue. And then ambassador's role is also pretty much constrained. It would be rather the Washington DC's uh, senior desk officers in the State Department or White House's uh, National Security Council members who will decide. Ambassador's role would be more like a facilitator and a communicator. While if he become too ambitious and try to get things done with his strong initiative utilizing his verbal skill, it may mm. generate great tension. And for instance, Japan, on the one hand, would re try to remain very loyal to the United States, but would always want to backtrack when it comes to the confrontation, joining confrontation with China, uh, being direct. He, Japan would not want to be direct by the United States in the course of military confrontation with China, although all alliance agreements and other things would make it uh, smooth cooperation. Japan is ready to do that. But still, domestic politics in Japan and Japan's own interests would keep Japan to be somewhat reluctant. So ambassador should play a very subtle game and a greater communicator and facilitator. Uh, that's my uh, view, yeah. I'm gonna say something that three members on the panel are probably going to disagree with. Uh, and that, that is that international relations is just the, is just the culmination of, 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 of domestic politics or a continuation rather. Uh, of domestic politics, uh, and I like to say that because I'm I study comparative politics uh, and I are light, uh, but in reality, obviously, it's the it's the interplay between international relations and domestic politics, and it seems like domestic politics is really geared uh, geared the decision uh, for uh, for who is going to be uh, who's going to be the ambassador. Uh, the other thing, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Kim would probably uh, agree that. Diplomacy might be a little bit more art than science, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how uh, Emmanuel actually uh, handles this in terms of diplomacy and negotiating uh, and and uh, um, basically facilitating uh, cooperation on a number of different levels between the U.S. and Japan, uh, and also the South Korea, uh, China, Russia issue. Yeah, one thing, guys, uh, that. I'm a little concerned about um, over my years of being here in Japan. Um, there, there seems to be a, a heightened sensitivity on the part of the Japanese government and the Japanese uh, population in general to criticism from the embassy of anything having to do with Japanese policy. So I remember when uh, Carolyn Kennedy was the ambassador, um, she made some mild criticism of the Japanese government and the response was just so strong. Or maybe it was because of the Japanese public view of her. She, of course, was probably the most famous ambassador in terms of notoriety because of the connection with the Kennedy administration. So I'm a little concerned that uh, if Rom 
goes into this role, if he, even if he doesn't mean to criticize Japan indirectly, maybe he's being, maybe, you know, in an American sense, sarcastic, uh, there's, there's a risk for Japan to misinterpret how that comment is made. Do you guys share that uh, concern? Or do you, first of all, do you agree with me that Japan seems to be hypersensitive to things that we say about uh, them, about their policies and so forth as, as a country? Well, I, would I, I don't know whether I would. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, uh, th sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether I would use the word hypersensitive, but the, the, look, they, they, they certainly uh, are always cognizant and, and will always want to understand, particularly where the United States is coming from on any given issue. That, that's definitely true. Um, I, I, I wouldn't call it hypersensitive, but, but th they, they certainly are, are paying attention. <laughs> As far as wh whether Rom is going to be sort of the bull in the china shop, he this look th this is a very politically astute individual. Okay, mm -hmm. he is he has been around for decades, and uh, while yes, he is known as someone who is you know quite headstrong and someone who who uh, has has you know not shy to uh, give his opinion. I think he 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 is he is smart and experienced enough to adjust his attitude accordingly and as as long as he has good advisors around him i i think he'll be able to navigate and walk that line quite well okay paul are you about to say something well, i was just going to add that uh, for all of us uh, who spent uh, most of our lives in japan uh one of the one of the challenges is to find who's is to find the the centers the centers of power who's really in charge and uh, that developed, that takes a lot of skill to develop those networks um, and uh, time, uh, takes time. And uh, exactly what uh, JD and others have been talking about is uh, certainly for domestic politics in the U.S., uh, he can go in uh, forcefully. That may not work uh, in Japan uh, as well, uh, or I think will not. You know, um, uh, one more minute. Uh, if I went through a list of post-war American ambassadors to Japan, um, uh, I would most likely say that you know, you know, there's Mondale and Foley and Baker and, and Carolyn Kennedy, but maybe the one that is loved the most or respected the most is Mike Mansfield, who always said, and it was repeated so many times, the most important bilateral relationship, bar none, is U.S.-Japan, and Jap Japanese love that. And people kept on saying that long after it was true. Um, so this is this is uh, what the Japanese want: is uh, they're going to compare um, uh, Rom to uh, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to China, which is Nicholas Burns, uh, career diplomat, tremendously um, uh, astute uh, at the diplomatic level. Interesting. I, I, uh, re really quick on that, when, when a lot of people, what I was seeing on Twitter, a lot of people were comparing the choice for the ambassador to China, Burns, versus the choice uh, for Japan. And I think that was a lot of the, the sense of uh, potentially, you know, a missed opportunity and taking China seriously in terms of foreign policy, at least that's how I read it, and not so much uh, in the case uh, of, of, uh, of Japan. Yeah. All right, guys, we're running short on time. We just have about five minutes left. So I'd like you to uh, get the crystal balls. Uh, Johnson, maybe off the back shelf there. I'm sure you have it there along with your books there <laughs> in the background. And uh, look into the future, assuming that uh, Ram gets through uh, the, the, the Senate hearings and so forth. Uh, probably he will, although there could be some pushback from both the, the right wing and the left wing on him. But let's assume he gets through and he becomes ambassador to Japan. So maybe just in a minute or so, each of you could let me know what do you think uh, he'll be a good ambassador? And also, let me know how long do you think he'll be in place? Because the last ambassador, Haggerty, who Jerry and I have both met through the ACCJ activity, he left after a couple of years and Trump never nominated anyone to replace him. So basically, we had a year and a half, two years with no ambassador. So Let's say uh, you're looking into the future. Will this be a good choice? Will he end up being a good ambassador overall, given what we've discussed? And how long do you think 
uh, he'll be in place, which is an important consideration. Why don't I start again with, uh, with you, Paul? It's an impossible uh, question to answer. Uh, because okay. <laughs> it depends on, it depends on, uh, on uh, you know, he, uh, who controls the narrative here and uh, whether or not uh, what the Japanese are looking for, what Washington is looking for, uh, what Congress is looking for, because Congress uh, is deeply involved in trade and there has to be a trade agreement. And U.S., uh, Japan, who's the biggest investor in the United States? Japan. Mm -hmm. um, who's America's what, fourth uh, largest trade partner or third? Japan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is serious stuff. <laughs> I mean, these are, this is big money here uh, at stake and, uh, and, and peace and security in the Indo-Pacific region. So you'll have to be um, careful. All right, thank you, Paul. Shiri, what, what what do you think? Yeah, I'm 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 optimistic. Uh, again, I thought it's a, a bold pick that I, I I think could could turn out actually quite well, very well. Uh, again, he he has with with Rahm Emanuel, Japan has a a direct uh, pipeline uh, to the president of the United States. So I think it could turn out very well. As for how long he'll be there, that, that, that's more difficult. You know, if yeah. a if a cabinet position were to open up, I mean, there are various various sure. things. Sure, yeah, I think with Haggerty, uh, but with you know, Haggerty, I, we learned this was a stepping stone to his uh, right. run for right. Senate in Tennessee, which he eventually did win. So right. he's now a senator there. Yeah, so, so that's a little bit harder to predict. But I, I I think as as with everything else he's done, Rahm Emanuel will put a lot of of effort and energy uh, into the job. All right, and Johnson. Look. Uh, I don't think I have enough data to assign a good probability to this. All right. Uh, and I want to be optimistic, and I also want to be invited to uh, to the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I, 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 I wish I had better information. <laughs> you and and if he gets confirmed, we're going to get more and more data uh, uh, as we as we move forward. So I hope it is a wonderfully fantastic choice. That's what I hope. All right. So that's why last word is with you. Yeah. I'm what is your, your, your educated guess as to what will happen? I'm cautiously optimistic, but there will be a lot of sensitive issues uh, uh, he will be uh, dealing with, like potential Japan's change of its constitution to be, take more proactive role. But there's a very thin margin. American ambassador could speak about those issues, such a sensitive issue. And uh, I noticed that he had a uh, until high school, he uh, was uh, active the ballet uh, performer. Yes, so that's right. Performance has a lot to do with the uh, music and words and ballet things like that, rather than very politically uh, naked political infighting. So he may take throw on his early experience as a performance dancer <laughs> uh, while working the thin rope of diplomacy. And then I, the reason why I become a bit uh, cautious, optimistic, he's also he wants to make a success with this. And it's such a strong political uh, instinct and sensibility. If he make good use of that while uh, making best use of his uh, staff's advice, because he will be supported by excellent group of staff uh, career uh, State Department officials in Tokyo Embassy, then he will make a success. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. As long as he right. learns moderation and maintains some calm in diplomatic practice. Excellent. Well, that's a very positive note to end on. Uh, thank you all. This is so interesting. I appreciate uh, all of you uh, contributing and being a part of this program. Uh, I want to remind our viewers that we're, there's a fund drive going on right now for ThinkTech, Spring Fund Drive, if you want to support these types of shows where you get uh, the view of what's going on in American politics from Japan and also, in the case of Paul, from Europe, to please contribute and support this effort. Uh, I'll see you guys again on my show in about a month or so, and I'll be featuring uh, the life of a venture capitalist in Japan. Uh, that'll be the show uh, that we'll do in a month or so. So thank you again, everyone, for participating and viewing. Appreciate it, guys. Thank We're you. out for today. Thank you.